All right, ladies and gentlemen, today I have Josh. Um, Josh is from J&H Tackle in Oakdale, Long Island. That's a tackle shop I refer to very frequently um, with gear, fishing reels, fishing rods. And Josh is going to put the voice to the name today. And we're going to talk about different stuff from tackle to random stuff to what he does differently and um, how he's working with the fishing community as, um, you know, as a tackle shop that listens to the average fisherman and works through me. So Josh, um, tell me, you know, introduce yourself and talk to the average viewer that doesn't know what J and H is just something that I blur out all the time. Sure. Well, well, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, I do things a little bit differently than most tackle shops. I think when you think of a tackle shop, you think of, you know, a couple guys in a small space who are just talking about tackle all day. I'm really fixated on, on fishing experience. And that might sound strange to people who have never heard me talk about it, because I, I do talk about it a lot. But my main goal is to make sure that the, the average fisherman who's going out, whether he's a novice, mid-level, or, or pro like you, Elias, has the best possible experience by using the right tackle. And that doesn't mean spending thousands of dollars. It, it could mean you know, hundred dollar combos and all this kind of stuff, because, you know, to have the best experience, depending on what you're doing, doesn't mean you have to spend a crazy amount of money. Although if that's the way you want to go, that's possible too. So I've embraced social media wholeheartedly. I started off, it's probably been six or seven years ago uh, on YouTube doing video reviews. I've done over 900 of them now, you know, product reviews of, of popular fishing tackle, mainly reels and that kind of stuff. And it's found me a, a pretty cool fan base of people who are just, into tackle and want to have a really good fishing experience from there i just expanded into you know facebook and instagram and um you know i've really actually embraced instagram more than anything else because i find that the community there is much more talkative much more into fishing passionately in terms of talking about it looking into the right stuff getting the right stuff getting the advice and also into guys like yourself and and uh John Skinner and Kid Cochise and, and Fishaholic and Landshark and all these people like you that are doing all this cool stuff of actually going out there, filming yourself on the water and showing people better techniques and how to do stuff. Um, so that's really what I'm about. I'm, I'm really about the social part of it, talking with people, answering questions, helping them as best I can, and just making sure they have the best fishing experience they could possibly have. That's what J&H is all about. Yeah, so to the guys listening, um, J and H works not just with me, um, other channels that he works, uh, the shop works with is, um, John Skinner, Fishaholic, Landshark. Um, did I miss somebody? Oh, Kitco Cheese Outdoors. So, um, Kitco Cheese yes. and a couple of guys on the West coast, yeah. you know, even, even, even the young kids, I get a lot of people reaching out to me who want to like get sponsored, you know what I mean? And it's, they're just too, too early in the game. Um, you know, you can't just have an Instagram page or just have a YouTube page and all of a sudden, boom, you get sponsored by me or any of the major tackle companies, you know, whether it's manufacturers or retailers, or whatever. And so I like to sort of give them advice on how they can do it. Cause I really believe that, you know, there's space out there for more people who do what you do, Elias. Um, because I don't like you know, hearing that. Into the <laughs> what the? I, said, I don't like hearing that. <laughs> no, I do. And I, don't. I know you don't like hearing it, but it, you know what it is? Like you, you have a certain niche and you're, you're great at it. And uh, I know you're going to continue to grow and grow and grow and, and be super successful. But there are spots for, for other people. It's, it's, it's not a full game yet. And, um, you know, so, so many people are so locked into video, um, you know, 24-7. I mean, I just watch my young kids and I watch them watching, you know, Dan TDM and these other guys who do animations and video games and all stuff. And, you know, the space is just wide open. So, yeah, I like working with uh, – YouTubers like you and, and guys on Instagram and stuff like that. It's just, it's cool and fun. No, and uh, it's, um, Josh routinely asks, uh, who are the YouTubers that aren't um, a joke? <laughs> so uh, he's working with uh, all the ones that are actually fishing based uh, channels right now, as opposed to, you know, it's a little bit of a clusterfuck out there. Of uh... <laughs> Well, yeah, well, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you about one of my mistakes, which was, um, working with, uh, you don't have to, say the, name. You don't have to with... say the name. You don't have to say the name of who it was. <laughs> so I, I started working out with her because I, I said to myself, you know, I want to, I want to get a, a bigger community, grow a bigger community. And she has a large community, but 
she's a mush mouth and she doesn't like what we call move units, meaning translate her promotion into uh, selling products is something that she just couldn't do. And so, you know, we, we dropped her and accurate dropped her at the same time. And I wish her all the luck in the world. It's, it's not a thing, but it's, it was a, it was a learning lesson for me that not, you can't just take someone who's popular. Uh, you know, I see these people with like a hundred thousand followers on Instagram and they're just going to have a hundred thousand followers on Instagram. Like they're not going to translate that into, you know, what we do. Now maybe they can do that if, you know, we, we were selling pocketbooks or makeup or, you know, energy drinks, but in fishing, you need to have a, um, a respect from the audience that they believe you, that you know what you're talking about, that you have their best interest in mind and that you're there to, you know, either entertain them or teach them something. And or informational, yes. Yeah, so, so or Josh or is, educational, yeah. yeah. So Josh is a reason like guys like me, Skinner, etc., can not necessarily have to worry about always every time we put out a video gunning for views because if people are like taking what we you know are more serious videos seriously of just us going out there catching fish explaining um that's already relevant because you know it there's a translation into somebody like j and h that the, the the fact that we're you know, show, using quality fishing gear and explaining it as opposed to just hunting for views. Um, at the end of the day, it makes me able to make those view videos with less views because um, there's an audience um, retention that's important as um, even though less people are watching, more people are, you know, shopping. All right, that reel's good. What he's fishing with works, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so right. The, so you get the double, you get the views and then you get, the you know bec because people trust your opinion and you've made yourself a uh, a trusted voice in, in the fishing community they trust you and then they buy x product and then of course we you know we compensate you through that so and, and all the youtubers we do that for and it's just a way to so that you can you know we want you to earn a living we want you to be successful and continue doing what you're doing and in order to do that you need like everybody else money and you 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 fish for a living like you're not you know, a teacher who just goes out in the evenings, like this is what you do for a living. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's that, it's that double thing where you're getting, yeah, you're getting your views, but you don't have to necessarily go out there and hunt for clickbait because that's all you need to make money. You have another, another source of income and hopefully are uh, being affiliated with us. And what I do brings actually more people to you, uh, just in general, because you get my audience, um, from Instagram and Facebook and, and YouTube and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, here's a, we can talk a little gossip too, kind of a juicy little thing too. So here's what I find interesting, and I love to hear your take on it too. So Josh, every and I told you a couple of days, all of us, you know, every you know YouTuber, we get solicitation probably every day from non, like OEM brands, right? From China, etc., India, you name it. Sure, sure. Every day I get emails, partner with us. Um, discounted affiliate links, blah, 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 from, and it's every day, like basically any Amazon based company or Alibaba based company. And th they're really pushed, given a hard push onto the, all the social media platforms. Well, explain in a little bit to your audience understands what, what like a quote unquote Amazon based business is. They might not know exactly I mean, what that yeah, is. Yeah. Any re no name brand real and, you know, there's probably at least 20 out there right now, maybe 100, who knows. Um, and most of them are low priced. There's probably a couple in the $100 range, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, and no, no, Shishimo, you know, Amazon, et cetera, they, um, all that stuff. Right. They, they just sell through Amazon, nothing else. It's not like they have retail that they sell through. Uh, you know, they don't have a big website or anything like that. It's just they go through Amazon because Amazon's a big. Uh, site or big uh, whatever marketplace yeah, has a better word for it. So yeah, okay, continue. So yeah, that's what that that means. Yeah. So all these brands are you know making a big push and they're contacting all the social media companies, I uh, know social media people or anyone who can you know tote their brand, and it's a interesting model, right? And I, there is something to be said about the success of that. I think it can work very well. But why do you think? All the other non, you know, and the, the normal brand, I don't want to call them the normal, but the, the, the well-known brands, Shimano, Daiwa, Penn, 
even the smaller guys that are, you know, Abbott, Siegler, et cetera, et cetera. Why do you think they haven't jumped on that bandwagon? Do you mean just doing the straight Amazon train? Not just the, not even just the straight Amazon train, but like that push, that aggressive push. You know, sometimes I respond to these emails to see how far I can push them with in terms of monetary compensation. I just like I'm curious. I'm like, well, you know, thanks for offering me free stuff, but here, here is my dollar value, right? And I just respond. And, but- so you mean more in terms of like why they don't um, invest more into um, the modern the modern version of advertising, which is YouTubers, Instagrammers, social media personalities. Right. Is that so I like open up a magazine fishing like every time I'm in a tackle shop waiting to fix my rod tip because I break them every week. Um, and right. I'm still seeing like pen advertise. And I just like to flip through the advertisements. And I'm like, you know, you told me an interesting story uh, once uh about a ad you did and i want you to share that one if you want to about sure, sure. Uh, you remember so, the yeah, one so you I'll, told I'll me? Go, yeah of course i did yes i'll go through all things so uh the joke that i've been saying for probably the past you know almost 10 years is that the people who are in the fishing tackle industry are 10 years in the past at least you know what i mean it's almost like a back to the future joke and what that's done is that that's allowed people like me who are who have who see social media and i include youtube in that for for the potential that it has and what it how it has transformed the industry and said i'm going to embrace that wholeheartedly i'm not going to be do magazine ads anymore newspaper ads none of that stuff um you know something that you guys might not know is there's a thing called co-op and co-op is a basically with certain manufacturers that they say okay we're going to get two percent of your sales and co-op meaning if I did a hundred thousand dollars of business with them, they're going to give me two thousand dollars, and I've got to use that two thousand dollars for for advertising. That's what that money is specifically for. So that is traditionally up until maybe this year, maybe last year, been basically exclusively for newspapers and magazines, right? So if you go through, I mean, I, you know, this is this is going all over the world, but if you just in our neck of the woods, like the Long Island fishermen, at one point in the year, especially towards the end of the year, you'll see from like five different little retailers, Shimano ads. And it just says, you know, a great selection of Shimano. Uh, we've got Travala rods and Talica reels. And it's, it's the ads useless and totally ridiculous, but it just says Shimano. And they're using that co-op money to, to pay for that, right? So if you think about that, how ridiculous that is, that nowadays that's still going on. Um, I mean, I had the... Uh, a person from a, from a magazine, I won't name the magazine, come in uh, about a week ago, and he's, he's trying to sell me on, on magazine ads. And, and within half an hour, he was telling me I should not work in the fishing industry and I should just, you know, be a consultant for social media, you know. Um, but the story you're, you're, you want me to tell, which, is, which was interesting, was this was probably, uh, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago, was I took out a uh, – you want me to say the magazine? Or no, don't, don't say the magazine, that? but the ad is just exactly okay. how it went down. is so, amazing. So there's a, there's this beautiful magazine in the Northeast. I took out, I believe it was a half page ad, right in the magazine, and we were doing a, a St. Croix sale. While we get uh, salesman samples from from the St. Croix, you know, the way the industry works is like, you know, the 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 sales rep has to buy his samples. So at some point, he gets rid of his, you know, t- 2017 samples are no longer good. He's getting all his 2018 things, so he's got to get rid of them. So he says to us, hey. Would you take my samples? You know, you can sell them for whatever. You just got to say the sample's great. Or, you know, St. Croix wants to get rid of some seconds that they have, and, um, you know, they need someone who's going to take them all. I'm able to do that, or J&H is able to do that. We do that. So I put an ad in there that's what was supposed to say, St. Croix rod samples, 50% off, right? Um, which is a great ad in itself. The magazine messed up, and they put St. Croix rods, 50% off, meaning every single St. Croix rod. So I saw that in and I was like, oh, what's going to happen here? You know, we're just going to get flooded. We got two calls. I mean, we literally got two calls for the whole thing or people coming in. That was it for that half page magazine and that's, that had that mistake in it. And you would think, I mean, I could put up an Instagram post right now about basically anything and sell more than two. And that's, you know, it's 11 o'clock at night or, or whatever. It, you know what I mean? It's just, it's it's striking that that was pretty striking for us yeah the, nobody actually you flip through it you see the pen ad and you're like okay now i guess it also is, is who's actually looking at these oh. these things so no i thought that was that's always an interesting story about modern day print advertising 
of where it's at and where it can go um, and who is that audience? It's more interesting where the industry is at. They're still doing it. Right. Like, and they're still doing it hardcore. And they like to say, oh, well, there's, there's still this audience. Like, there's this magical older audience that just spends so much money, right? Like, like they're the driving force in the, force in the tackle industry, buying their, you know, Jigmasters and, you know, all this other garbage. When really it's millennials and, um, you know, guys up, in, in, up until their mid-40s. But that, like, older generation is really not our customer base. It used to be. Like, I used to see them in the store all the time, and they were the guys who wanted the you know, the, the ugly sticks and the $20 rods and all this kind of stuff, you know, this, this low end stuff that, that, you know, they were just going to go out with and, and fluke fish, you know, with 50 pound mono and, you know, all this ridiculous stuff. And, um, they've kind of not died off is not the right word, but they've sort of moved on. You know I mean? They, that audience is not at all on my radar because it's not, it's not a factor. I mean, how do I, how do I, reach a guy that I have to do magazine ads for. That's the only way he's going to find it. He doesn't have an email address. I still get people call me and say they don't have an email address. And I go, I don't know, what year is it? I, you know, I don't know what's going on. This is crazy. Yeah, no, it's tough. It's uh, that's just a generational divide too. So what I'm curious about is like, you know, that the, you know, I'm fishing with, you know, four or five different, you know, brands of reels right now. I have, what am I have? I have Shimano. I've got Penn. I've got Daiwa. And I've got Tsunami, right, as my active... Tsunami, yeah. Yeah, the four reels that are actively coming out there with me. So, you know, as I, as I get those solicitations every day from a Chinese company that would love to have me or anybody, I mean, just exclusively using their brand, I'm always amazed that, you know, that even... It doesn't take much for a manufacturer like Daiwa or somebody to be like, all right, Josh, you know, we will supply this guy with the reels we want him to just exclusively fish, you know, this brand. Right. So for those who you don't know, because it's so tough in the industry and because these, these places are so, uh, I don't want to say negative towards uh, guys like you, but because they haven't embraced it in the way that I have, I sort of put myself in the role of like manager of you guys in a sort of a way, you know, like defender where you know, I strongly believe that you guys need to be compensated fairly for what you do. Um, and I fought on behalf of of you and Skinner and all these guys um, because I really believe that. But sometimes you just can't get through these people and then they have unrealistic expectations of things and it just gets hard. So I sort of, I do it especially with John because John's um, popularity is, is sort of on another level now. Um, to where, you know, and, and he's such a nice guy and he's, you know, he's on the hunt for, for good content all the time. And I totally get that. You know what I mean? He wants, he wants something cool and new so that he can, he can do his videos and, and get views and get compensated and all that stuff. You know what I mean? Just like you would. Um, but they, you know, I, I was, I remember I was at, I was at, um, I went down to the Bassmaster Classic and I was talking about you know, compensating people for rods, right? So we were talking, I forget, we were talking about one of these freshwater guys from 10 years ago, whatever it was. And I said, how much does he get compensated for his rods? I think the rods retail for like $60. And they said, uh, I said, what does he get? He gets like, um, you know, let's say, I don't know, let's say wholesale $40, right? Just a round number. So does he get like $4, right? I'm thinking he gets 10% of wholesale. Like that, that seems like a fair, fair compensation. And um, they go, oh, no, he got like a dollar a rod. I go, a dollar a rod? And they're like, yeah, but he sold 200,000 rods, let's say. I go, yeah, but he sold 200,000 200, rods over the course of, you know, six, seven, eight years, right? So how does that add up? You know what I mean? Just in terms of how much the manufacturer sold and, and what he was compensated for. I know it kind of sounds like a lot of money, but it's really not. Like if you're if you're that popular – that you could move 200,000 rods, you shouldn't be getting a dollar a rod. You know what I mean? It doesn't make a $50 rod. You shouldn't be getting a dollar a rod. It doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. And there's no incentive, right? So I think that's why, I, you know, there's a lot of people in this industry in the marketing departments of these tackle shops who think they know. Oh, yeah, I know this, I know that. And I think what they are is 
uh, half in it. Well, you know, it happens with a lot of fishermen. Uh, you know, a little, here's a little secret that I, I tell everybody anyway, is that there's a difference between me and most of the guys in this industry in that I'm not as in love with fishing as everybody else is, meaning I don't go to work, then go fishing, then go to sleep, then go to work, then go to fishing. You know, that's not my thing. I'm big into business. That's what I like. That's what I enjoy. I enjoy fishing. Um, but my driving force is to have a successful business for me and my family and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like all these guys who, you know, they go, they do their job, maybe they work hard at their jobs. I'm not saying they don't. But then after that's done, they just they just go fishing. And, they, and that's their focus, and they're into fishing. And they're not looking at other industries, and they're not looking at what's actually happening around them. And sure, they see Instagram's popular, and they see, oh, there's a lot of people on Facebook. But they're not, you know, looking at, like, what's Microsoft doing? Or, uh, oh, you know, I just ate at this restaurant, and they did a really cool promotion. What's, let, me, let me look into that further, and maybe I can use that for me you know, for my company or, you know, the company I work for, whatever it is, whether it's Dio or Pen or whatever, and apply that, that would be a really cool thing. You know what I mean? Like, they're not doing that. They're just sort of following suit of what everybody else in the industry is doing. And if everybody else in the industry is doing nothing, then they're, <laughs> they're doing exactly that. Do you think that's a main reason a lot of these new OEM companies have had so much success is because the old players weren't able, didn't adapt in time? Well, I, I think it's a combination of things. I mean, and what really I mean, let me business. explain explain what OEM yeah, yeah. is. You have a pretty good explanation of that. Sure, sure. So OEM is basically you go to a manufacturer and you say, I want you to make up this knife and I want you to put my name on it or I want you to call it this, that, the other thing. That's OEM as opposed to buying like a pen spin fisher. Um, I could say to Penn, I want you to make the same reel, but I want you to call it the Josh. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that would be an OEM version of it. Right, and so, the biggest brands out what, there, who's the biggest brands? Um, Tsunami, is Tsunami OEM? I don't know. Tsunami's not an OEM. That's that's different. OEM is, is, uh, is Tsunami's its own brand. 13 Fishing's right? all OEM? I, yeah, I guess you can call that OEM. Oh, that lose okay lose. um you know there's there's a ton of little companies like if you see any little company that's importing from china that's pretty much what you would consider oem favorite um favorite yeah absolutely favorite um OEM, yeah. i think i think this is this is probably the most interesting story that most people don't know so if you're listening to this now this is something that after you finish listening to this this portion of it i mean listen to the end of the show but Go go research this. Go look into this because this is fascinating from an American standpoint. In that, what happened was is, you know, twenty or thirty years ago, when people started importing fishing tackle from China, what you're really doing because it's basically lawless in China. You know what I mean? It's not like they have strict regulations where if you steal um, my ideas, you're going to jail or anything like that. It's you know, you're going to another country, communist country, where um, formerly communist. They just what the formerly con anyway keep going <laughs> no they're, con they're still communist but they just they want to do as much business as they can to build up their economy and get as much dollars so you know if an american worker is going to get paid i'm just using random numbers but they're pretty accurate 15 dollars an hour versus making it and having a person get paid 50 cents an hour you can see the difference in cost now everything else is the same the materials the machinery you know, everything else is the same. If you want to make a, a, a plastic lure, it's going to cost you the same for materials in China, the machinery, the molds, all that kind of stuff versus America. But it's that labor, right? So you have a significantly lower labor. And what you're doing is all the major manufacturers are going over there, in, specifically in one area called Weihai, and, and just, you know, basically giving them technology so that they'll build this stuff, right? They're teaching them. And now the, the Chinese have... 20 or 25 years of experience. No one else has that kind of experience. And now they are on the cutting edge. They have all the technology. And now that they, they can OEM for anybody. But what they've done, and what you alluded to with the Amazon thing, was Amazon such, is such a big marketplace. And there's so many people that you can basically, or they can basically make their own products, you know, take whatever product you want, change it up a little bit, put their name on it, put it up on Amazon. And you've seen the numbers, Elias. Yes. Sell tons of it where they're consistently in the top because 
they, they're, there's no resale. You know what I mean? There's no, there's no middleman. They're going direct. They're skipping any sort of wholesaler or retailer, and they're just going straight to Amazon. Amazon's getting their 15 points, which to them is nothing because they have something that they, they, they made for $2, and they're putting it on Amazon for 10 It means at the end of the day they're getting 850 right? So it's, it's, it's this huge win for them, and, and people don't seem to mind. You know what I mean? They buy all this low-end stuff. Some of it works. Some of it doesn't work. But yeah, Amazon will take care of your customer service either way. Right. And I don't think it's a thing like if it fails that people care because they paid, you know, there's a certain, like, we talk about the Brave thing. Like, you know, if you're, if you're unwilling to pay $15 for a spool of Power Pro, that's, that's ridiculous to me. You know what I mean? I mean, what's, if you paid $12 for Brave versus 15 is that, a, you know what I mean? Like, like certain things you don't go down on. You don't go lower on. It doesn't make any sense to me. There's no, there's no, re, you know, over the course of that reel, three dollars is, or that line, three dollars is, is nothing. You know what I mean? You keep that line in there for three, four seasons, right? Um, and if you're fishing hard, you definitely should be using like twelve dollar line. You know what I mean? Or eight dollar line, or whatever some of that cheap stuff is. Uh, you should be getting better stuff so you have better performance. You know, so it, that that whole situation of China, the technology, the importing, and Amazon all together. Um, really is probably one of the worst things that, that's happened uh, to you the think country it's, you think that, that but, no one talks about. I mean, looking at, right now, it looks like one of the things that it's like, you know, as you said, that, that allowed the OEM guys to really sneak in and, you know, put a dent in, you know, Amazon being the platform. Otherwise, OEM couldn't have launched. And, and OEM working with social media people while the other guys kind of slept on it, you know? Um, o- OEM exactly. was the, they worked exactly they worked with people. OEM was the first one, and then they made their dent in the marketplace, and they took away the market share from Shimano, Pen, Daiwa, etc. They took away a significant market share and from tackle shops too. You know, absolutely not just you, but everybody. I, you know, this... I, yeah, no, I think Bubble Blade is a great example mm-hmm. because Bubble Blade was a great idea. You know, that handle is awesome, right? And the idea to make those kind of eyes, but those are all you know, imported from China and, you know, almost infomercial style sold on Amazon, not exclusively, but they sold a ton of them on I mean, a ton of them on Amazon. Uh, and they, they cut everybody out and, and did their thing, which, Hey, I, I get it. You know, it's that kind of a product, but that's, that's the kind of stuff, you know what I mean? Um, where people, you know, bubble blades aren't bad. I'm not saying it's a bad knife. You shouldn't own one. I, you know, probably most of the guys who work with us own it, but that's the pattern. Meaning that guy, that guy was smart and he saw, wow, I have a pretty cool product. And, and my best way to get the most penetration is just to go through Amazon because right. it's going to cost me less. You know, I'm giving 15 points to Amazon. I'm going to give a dealer, uh, you know, 30, 40 points. Right. Why don't I just sell direct? You know what I mean? And there's nothing that you, no one's going to say boo about it because if they say boo, you, just, you know, the dealer, they just say, well, you know, who are they going to cut off, the dealer or Amazon, right? Right. Uh, I mean, all right, let's 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 talk, you know, enough about Amazon and OEM and brands. Um, let's talk stuff that listener might find useful. Uh, <laughs> so sure. I was thinking a couple of good questions to ask you since you're always selling reels and dealing with customer service of reels. Let's talk best values. You can take your, pick your brand. Okay, sure. Your um, what is the currently in 2018 on in September? What do you think is the best one hundred dollar fishing reel available? Best two. Give two options. Give two. Uh, you know, you're talking spinning, right? Spinning. Um, they're they're you know depending on what you're doing. I mean, probably Daiwa just has it on lock. Uh, they're raising the price on the the Daiwa BG um, for oh, that are, huh? more more yeah well that more that you know i say this i it's probably the wrong word to say inshore and nearshore because you you know they're inshoring with with bgs um but there's that super lightweight style reel right and then there's that heavier um bigger main gear kind of reel and that um that bg's got it on lock their their fuego is is really nice too Although a lot of people like the Tsunami Shield, a lot of people like the Shimano Nasky. So you got a lot of choices in that category. I was sort of surprised that Penn didn't um, had the battle. revamp the, the battle, battle this year. The battle seems to have but, fallen off of popularity lately. 
falling off, but you know they're going to do it next year. I mean, if you're and if you're a step below that, you guys really have to check out the new Pursuit Three, because the new Pursuit Three is almost like a battle two, but like between forty and sixty bucks. Wow! Like it's uh, it's really nice for the money. For a there's nothing else. There's nothing else even in that forty to sixty dollar category. I mean, some people like Daiwa Rev Roast. That's a nice reel, but uh, for my money, I, I would go with the Pursuit Three. Pen Pursuit. So there you go. That's your low end. Best choice is that pen pursuit, and um, so you're saying the BG is still the the king of the hundred dollars, more or less. They just hold up. They never come back. No one complains about them. They're just really well built. You know what happened with them was they they were supposed to come out at a much higher price point, which eventually the uh, the Saltus did, right? So Saltus and BG are basically the same architecture. Differences like mag sealed and the Saltus uh, versus the BG and you know, I don't know. I don't know why they priced it at ninety nine, but it was one of those. You know, almost like a um, tsunami slow pitch being priced at a hundred bucks. It's a, uh, it's an absolute deal. Mm -hmm. Damn. Um, what's it called? Actually, I actually had a couple of people asking me about the Daiwa Saltist because um, since I haven't used it, but um, have you been? What's your feedback on that versus the other? It's a two hundred dollar reel, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's two hundred dollar reel. You know, I, I like it. It's a nice reel. I fished it. Um, you know, for my money, I would I would still go with the BG. Really? Uh, it's just, See, this is a yeah. tackle shop owner not taking your two hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I've um, I even asked the designer of the reel. Um, you know, the just a, an interesting thing tidbit about it is the BG has like a, a straight solid wire bail, and the Saltus has like the air bail. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said to him, I said, you know, I was asking about the differences and, and we just got to talk about the bail. And he's like, you know, bail, and he says Japanese, sort of broken English, but super nice dude. He was like, you know, bail on the beach is better. He's like, it's just so much more rugged. You know, if you're out in the water, you're bouncing around, that thing falls. There's a lot higher chance that the air bail is going to crack or bend versus that solid wire bail, which will just keep ticking, you know. So things you don't normally think about or you don't, you wouldn't know unless, people tell you i mean that's that's one of my biggest gripes in this industry is that you know people never explain things in the right way you know it's it's, it's that whole thing about everything's a black box like yeah i know how to drive a car <laughs> but doesn't necessarily mean that i know how every part works and interconnects and fishing reels are the same way you know it's like well what's behind that side plate and that's why that's actually why i started working with um tackle advisors uh, if you guys haven't checked out his channel, he's a really Nick over tackle guys. He's a cool dude. And he actually goes in and shows you differences and comparisons between these reels. So you can sort of get a feel for, for that part of it. So it's not so much a mystery anymore. Yeah. What do you think about Penn lately? Do you think Penn has turned itself around in the last year? I, I'm started slowly coming around from Penn from 2007 to 2010, my opinion of it, to Penn in 2018 between the Slammer 3 and the um, the new spin fisher, which I got to use this last month. Um, but you were, you seem to be more impressed with the stuff that when we were at ICAF and you were playing with the pen stuff than, uh, than you had previously been, right? So you've, well, you've been, you've been fishing that spin fisher. What do you think of it? I mean, uh, so my, my previous pen, my most recent pen experience was pen battle twos, which I've destroyed. And, sure. and I've had those fail in multiple areas. Pen conflict, which I've also had failures. And what was the other one? Pen Conflict. I have one more pen that was giving me problems. Uh, I think it might have been one of the Spin Fisher generations um, with the like the lousier metal handle. That one was the least of the issues that had, out of the conflict in the battle. So far, well, we should also notate that and say that you're probably the hardest person on their gear around. Like you're you're not you're not soft on your ear. Like you right, work so, that stuff. So really I tell hard. Josh all the time, um, being so low on the water with the kayak. I always take spray. Like a minute, there's like a little bit of a chop out on the water. It's like spray is hitting the reels, right? The reels are constantly getting sprayed with salt water. Um, I don't. They don't dunk. Very rarely do they end up dunking, but spray is always an issue. Um, that also that um, yeah, I'm hard on the gear. Absolutely, I'm hard on gear. Um, so I've used the Spin Fisher VI. Um, I haven't caught anything under 30 pounds with it, so that's good uh, in terms of what I've been using, doing with it. Um, no, it's a, it's, it's definitely a solid construction reel. I've liked it. I, I, the Pen Slammer also. Um, 
versus the you know the Shim it's just a different experience you know the shimano it's not a shimano drag system it's not a shimano handle system that's all buttery smooth when it's in mint condition but i feel like these newer pens i don't expect the f previous failures to happen that happened on my older pens that i used to use um and right you yeah the, the reels are definitely getting better i'm actually really impressed with the spin fisher uh it's basically i mean you can call it a pared down slammer three i like to think of it as like gen two just because while certain things are pared down you know the the seals and the fact that now you have a long cast version and the live liner version and the bailus the two bailus versions especially the smaller one you know just give people a lot of options which is great in a reel that's sealed like that you know no no i agree and it's um no, I think their 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 popularity. I mean, they always have a loyal fan base, but I think they the last these last two reels have actually been like a little bit more impressed with them. And not, you know, I'm not my my negative feelings towards pen reels in general are absolutely turning around. Um, and you know, and also the price points are still really good on those. The spin fishers are what 150 to 170. They went up a little bit. They're they're I think 170 or 150 to 200, but still, you know. Nothing crazy. So, um, what you know, else? if you're going to spend 170 on a reel, you got to spend 200 on a reel. It's not, you know. Right. Yeah. No. It's definitely it's it's not a deal breaker. It's it's, it's that hundred dollar to two hundred dollar real price point, you know, matchup kind of kind of thing. Um, what else yeah. can we talk about? That's kind of interesting. I had another thing that was going to. Um, so what's interesting about um, Josh's JNH um, dot com is. You, it's, you can find a lot of specialty products. You carry you carry a lot of niche stuff, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I've um, I've sort of embraced the niche because it, for number one, it gets people talking, right? It's, it's more of an interesting thing. Like like I know I've never I've never bought. At least I can't remember a niche product that I've bought. I always tell um, him what to buy too. I tell him like buy those bottom sweeper jigs, and eventually he did. <laughs> Yeah, no, well, it didn't take me that long to bring in the bottom yeah. supers, and we've actually done really well with them. And uh, Dan, who, who runs that company, is a super cool dude. And um, no, the, the bottom supers have been doing really well. Um, but I don't look at it like like that was that's different, you know. I think when you when you think niche products, I think of like um, some of the stuff we've done in freshwater, embracing the, you know, mostly it's got uh, a custom plug makers who live up in the Northeast. Most of them are in like Massachusetts area. Uh, Keep guys in California who make different kinds of soft plastics, uh, JRP fishing and um, Eurojet, uh, NorCal Cat. You know these brands that I've just really seen on Instagram and, and are interesting, and I and I reach out and I, I introduce myself if they don't already know who I am, and say, hey, you know, I know you can't supply me with hundreds of everything. You know what I mean? I know you can't do that, but give me give me ten or twenty a month, and let's let me just promote you. And it's just, you know, it's something cool for me because it gives me content, gives me something new to, to talk about. And, and it, it sort of wows my customers who aren't going to see that kind of stuff in New York. That's only basically sold in California. And um, it's, it's good for them because they get a ton of publicity that they wouldn't, you know, we I'll open you it up to market. Here, from the Carolinas, what's a good brand? They don't have much of a social media presence, though, yet. They need to. Um, Spanish candy jigs are very popular. Albacore, albilores. So we know albilores are good. Uh, Spanish mackerel. Sure. Yeah. Well, we just started carrying um, albi snacks. There you go. So, you know, we we also do this thing like if you're a customer and you want us to carry something, you said something cool, even if you're not sure about it, I'll do the research. I'll look into it, and if it works for J and H, and I think it'll work for my customers, I'll bring it in. Like with the you know, you mentioned the balance sweeper jigs to me, you know. I have no problem doing that, and that gives, you know, I, I hope that that guy gets more exposure because of that, Dan, you know, who, who Insomniac, uh, that he gets more exposure because his jigs are really nice, and I like I like working with those smaller guys who are ambitious and, and want to grow. I mean, we just took on Mad Mantis. I don't know if you saw that yet. New pencil poppers and some other stuff. You make tuna poppers. And, um, you make tuna poppers, yeah. And um, he's got some big guy with this big thing he's a small guy and he's trying to do his thing and make a living and he makes a really a really nice product that's interesting uh you know, you know john skinner has been fishing with them uh so you know i i like the niche stuff it's different you know the, i think the, the freshwater stuff is actually more difficult 
we've actually changed our mind or changed our direction on that. Gone from a, you know, we, we started in Freshwater just a couple of years ago because we see how big the market is. We have such a reach. Why not reach that market, which is just huge, you know, freshwater bass fishing. And we started off with big swim baits and some other stuff. And we realized this year, really, that we got to sort of stay away from the common stuff and go with that niche stuff. Meaning, like, I'm never going to dominate freshwater. It's just too difficult. It's, it's a very difficult market unless you have tons of money. So why not get into, like, you know, all the Japanese stuff, the rare Japanese stuff, and the American stuff that's these, you know, uh, reg, just regular people who are... You know, they're like artists. Like, you know, you know all these plug guys. Right, they're all it's insane, an art. Absolutely. You know? Plug buildings and art and you know, all that stuff. Absolutely. Right. But these people are generally, they're generally insane. <laughs> you know, <and laughs> like I, me. I, there's not a single one that I, exactly, there's not a single one of them that I haven't said that to. So they're not learning, hearing anything new from me. But um, they, they're they artists. Yeah. And their, their platform is, instead of paintings or sculpture, it is fishing lures. You know, and they make this, some of the stuff is gorgeous. I mean, absolutely beautiful, stunning stuff that, you know, some of your audience might not even fish with. They just want to keep it on their desk to look at while they're at work, you know, makes them think about being on the water. Um, but I like, I like supporting those guys and working with those guys. And um, like I said, with the freshwater stuff, finding those guys who make custom swim baits, they make them out of resin as opposed to wood. And these guys are just, you know, they can make it sink five feet they can float it they can do what you can make it do whatever they want they're so good at it um so uh, and what's the name of the guy that we do he, he makes the hoochie mamas and the uh oh tater hog when you guys get a chance look up tater hog fishing don't just type in tater hog.com that brings up something weird but i think you got to type in like tater hog fishing or tater hog <laughs> swimbait and i'm telling you you don't, I don't even want to go it's just sad and what you into, just sad and i'm like brings up something weird and I was it, like, yeah i mean if you wanted to type in tater hog you'll yeah something weird will come up but tater hog lures tater hog i forget what it is and that dude's name is matt and he is super cool and he makes some outrageously awesome looking stuff and it fishes great and guys love it and it's yeah it's expensive it's you know hundred two hundred dollars swim baits and awake baits and all this kind of stuff that they're all hand painted and and it's just you know that's not the bread and butter for us but that's sort of the interesting fun stuff that we get to do because of all the bread and butter stuff you know all right so josh we're running running on time so we i got a couple more things quick all right josh so uh, this audience i mean you know your new york and new jersey region so this audience that's listening is coastal right so you got maryland people sure. you have virginia you got north carolina make your pitch now why in the future that instead of ordering from Amazon, their fishing tackle, they should order from somebody like you. Even they don't have to be sure, like yeah. you exactly, but you know, some people are like, yeah, nah, I'm gonna order like, look, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be me. There are other independent retailers, mom and pop shops that are local. Um, you should just support local or support the people that support you. I mean, I've, I go out of my way for customer service. That's my number one thing. I want to work with people. I'm, I'm the only owner of a fishing tackle company of my size that is going to get on, you know, answer the phone, gets on the phone, answers every single question, answers every single email, DM, all that kind of stuff. Uh, because I believe that that's the best way to do business. And um, you're just not going to get that from, from Amazon. And I get it. Amazon's super easy, super convenient. You know, it's almost like the inescapable beast in a sort of a way. But I think you do have to resist a little bit because, you know, when you see businesses going out of business, a lot of that is, is Amazon or Walmart. And you say to yourself, well, you just weren't, you know, you just weren't savvy enough or you didn't work hard enough to, to keep your tackle store open or hardware store or whatever the business is. But the reality is, is that, you know, it's like Monopoly. And when at the end of that game, that one player has the bank, and that's what Walmart and Amazon is, they are the bank, you can't win. You know, you can only hope to sort of survive and strive by doing things differently from them. Um, but we could eventually go to a, you know, system where there's really two two stores. You know, if, if young people don't get into owning businesses, you know what I mean, retail locations or web businesses, and just go and work at Amazon and um, Walmart, you know, your your choices and your your ability to get what you want is going to go down. Um, so, you know, again, if you don't want to buy from me, that's totally cool. 
buy from your local mom and pop shop, buy from some some of these other independent shops that treat you right and and really want to work with you. Or, you know, J and H is always here for everybody, but um, everybody's got to do their own thing. So and, for the um, guys that are are in the loop, I've brought it up plenty. Josh has um, was the one the first guy when I brought up what post Florence what to do or pitching ideas. He grew up the Stratic. We, as of this recording, and I'm, I don't know when this podcast will go up, will go up. We've raised over two thousand dollars in raffle funds and just the Shimano Stratic. And in terms of what Josh said about being in the loop. Um, with the fishing community right there, he responded to what I said, asked. I said, listen, um, this is probably, you know, this community is hurting. What do you think? What can you do? And, and you know, there it is. This is the first, uh, you, you know, I wouldn't be begging on the doorstep of Amazon. I would never get <laughs> But <laughs> no, what I'm I mean, saying I, is... I, I, am, I am blown away by the response by your audience. That is so awesome that so many people would would get involved. I mean... Again, it just shows you, and I'm going to go back to all those other those manufacturers. Like, if Penn or Dio is listening to this, look look at what just happened. We we put a, a you know you Elias put a reel up on YouTube, said hey, uh, we're giving this away for charity for for the, the hurricane uh, you know efforts whatever whatever money where it goes to, and um, two thousand dollars in it's been what two days day and a half. Two days. So far. So, yeah. so I, we days, upped the so. ante a little bit. So I, I'm, I, I, I recorded it. So the, it started with the Stratic. And literally, you know, Josh put up the Stratic for me to donate. And we raised 2000 bucks. I got, um, you know, Bowed Up Lures has committed some lures to me. Bottom Sweepers has committed some lures for more prizes. Rob Choi does some awesome fish prints. Another prize. And um, I'm throwing in a Pen Slammer, that, uh, my Pen Slammer 3. So we raised 2000 bucks. Um, you know, the, the listeners that, you know, might've donated, this is the man who kind of really threw the initial idea at me, at me, gave me the initial something to give away. Um, so, you know, I'm sure he, you know, he deserves the credit just as much as you do for donating and the average person that's here, you know, listening to this, that might've been involved with the initial, you know, raffle donations too. So everybody is, um, a part of this, but, you know, as a shop, you know, Josh gets a, you know, that's a, a, a big thank you for me and the, the coastal community and everybody because he's in the loop and, and cares. And, you know, like you said, you want everyone to have a good fishing experience. So there it is. That's yeah. I mean, that's what I'm about. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, sometimes I feel like this, this whole industry is, is pulling at each other and they're, they're the, the people in the industry are so petty, but then you get to the actual fishermen and they're just such nice people and they're so engaging and they want to learn and they want to, have fun. And did that's you what think really I would raise two thousand dollars? I had no idea I would raise that much that quick. I did not think these people, Crazy. Uh, these people. I mean, I didn't think the audience would. Uh, my my initial goal was like a hundred dollars to two hundred. Sure, yeah. Well, your audience is so hateful. But that's just the, <laughs> the playful, the, play, the playful way they play with you. So you know? they, I always show they, Josh they my troll hard. comments. I always show him who's trolling me this week. So he gets he everybody's, thinks... you know, everybody's from Staten Island. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and it's, uh, you know, that's just that's the crew. But in times of need and when when things are on the line, they show up, which is amazing. That's wonderful. Yeah. So. And I'm super glad that I could have even a small, a small, tiny role in it, you know, and then it's just a testament to your, your reach, you know, and that's what these, all these manufacturers and all these marketing people who think they know what they're talking about need to see that guys like you are the future of advertising in, the industry, in this industry, period. That's it. And either you're going to get on board or you're going to get left behind because paying $3,000 for a magazine ad and saltwater sportsmen ain't going to do nothing. I mean, you know look I mean? at tackle you're advisors. Not gonna get anywhere. Look at look at tackle advisors. That channel. I mean, the listeners here probably check his stuff out. But my God, that guy must sway so much money from moving around to wrong places. Absolutely. He A lot must. of you guys. I mean, you know, if you talk with talk with Rich from Fisherholic, ask him to tell you his his tsunami shield story and how many shields he he moved just by doing his videos and showing what he does on the water. You know, it's not it's not insignificant. You know what I mean? It's not. I mean, if 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 I told you guys, how, you know, the amount of bucktails that John Skinner moves is insane. It's absolutely 
insane. I mean, our big bucktail used to be Spro, uh, and that was two years ago. John's Bucktails came out last year, outsold Spro. This year, it's probably 10 to 1. That's huge. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy, uh, but it's, again. I think that also has to do, I mean, the John Skinner thing is like, it's also like, I would go out and buy a John Skinner bucktail because I like John Skinner. And if I can fish with a bucktail and pay a dollar extra versus a Spro and support John Skinner in any way, I will, you know. But, you know, versus the Tsunami Shield, which I, I look at it a little differently. Somebody buys an Elias Shed, they might just hang it on their wall for all I know. No, <laughs> like, no, like, no. Oh, it's nice. Let me just buy the shed and it'll sit here for a while. But I, I, it, but versus the normal, you know, like Tsunami or Pen, and et cetera, et cetera. Right. You know, but look, I've, I've, had, I've, had, too- I've had multiple people come up to me this week uh, saying that they've, you know, recently gotten big fish on your sheds. Oh, yeah, and oh I, thank you, thank too, you so much happens, for these. But... You know, it's again, but it's not. See, when you're when you're in the tackle shop, and you're a guy like me, and I talk to everybody, and I make myself the face of my company, um, because I think that's the best thing for my company. Um, everybody wants to say hi. Everybody wants to talk, and everybody wants to tell their story. And you get mentioned a fair amount. You know, it's not like. It, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, like, sort of put it into perspective for people. I mean, I think the Skinner story is, is, is really good and powerful because, you know, Spro is like the name. You know what I mean? Oh, it's the and name. Yeah. And in, in such a quick amount of time, and they know it, and they talk to me about it a little bit. You know what I mean? They don't want to say too much. Um, but it's just, you know, the power of what you do to influence people in a positive way, Usually. is not to be not to be overlooked. It is Usually. significant. It's it's significant. And I know you're the most negative person on the planet, uh, <laughs> but it it just it just is. And and again, I'm I'm working with four, five, six different guys, and it's happening with all of them. I mean, not not all to the same extent, but we're seeing that when guys like you are product focused, are willing to give your opinion on things. And actually show, hey, look, look at me. I've got this shield reel, or maybe you're fishing with a dark matter rod, or you know, or it could be another brand rod. Week, as it does, <laughs> um, you know, it, it it gets people to say, oh wow, I want I want to be like Elias. I mean, my joke, as you know, I've told you, is like, be like Mike, right? Everybody wants to be like Michael Jordan. I want to be like Mike, and that's that's you guys. You guys are. Mike, you guys are the Michael Jordans of, of this industry right now. And some people might be sc- scoffing and all that stuff, but, you know, it's, it's just a fact. Like, it's an inescapable fact that when you guys do something, it moves markets. And these, these manufacturers, I, I don't know if they'll ever wake up to it, but, you know, they might wake up to it with their, uh, you know, butts being kicked. Yeah, after Shishimo is now number two. Yeah, that's... It is what it is. Let me, you know what? Let me ask you a question, Lars, yeah, which I uh, which I always wanted to ask you, which was, tell me the origin of your love of fishing. Like, who was the first person to get you into it, and then how did it evolve? Wow, it we're talking about my. Lo- you're talking about you use the word love and me. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, you love one thing. Uh, we well, know you love fishing. Um. So. And and staying in in cheap hotels. Yeah. Right. Um, so my dad took me freshwater fishing a lot. So I cut my teeth in on freshwater, you know, as a teenager. Um, I had a couple saltwater creeks with lots of sunken cars in Brooklyn. You know, there used to be like, you know, seven, 1970s Chevys in there, all sorts of trucks. It was a dumpster basically. And that was Garretson Creek. We also had Bill Basin Creek, all these Brooklyn creeks and Sheepshead Bay and I used to catch a lot of fish from the surf. I put the time in and, you know, all these back bays and the ocean locally. I don't know. It was something about just seeing these big-ass bluefish. I remember that was a lot of my early fishing memories were with big bluefish. Just seeing them in these creeks, getting my ass kicked by them all summer long. And then you know, I'm breaking most of them off, but landing a couple. And I don't know how it ended up... Um, being something that I transitioned into wanting to make a living off of. Um, it was probably maybe. Well, how did you, how did you, how did you transition from just like your first couple times going out to making a conscious choice? Right. Doing I, I, I mean, I remember in college, 
I, in college, I was, like, real hesitant. Should, like, was I, should I be, like, spending all this time fishing? Like, it was, like, or should I be doing this social life thing? Like, you know, I always would, like, try to, di- like, I'd be, like, torn. Should I be out partying all night or should I be going fishing the next morning? And a lot of times I end up going fishing. And same thing in, in post-college. Uh, I vowed not to take a 9-to-5 job. I always took 12 to 8 so I can go fishing in the morning. Right. That was a big thing in my post-college years was to, like, I'm not working 9 to 5. I was, like, I refused 9 to 5. And, yeah, I don't know. It's, like, and you know, how to, how it ended up becoming, like, okay. As a, you know, there's also um, kayak fishing, actually, at one point in my life, I lost a lot of weight from it. It was a positive change in that. I was probably like 30 to 40 pounds overweight at one point, like in college and post-college years. And man, I lost a ton of weight on that stupid kayak when I just got into it too. So that was a big part. And it's of it all too. from pedaling, right? You're just Yeah, pedaling. Right? And same thing now. It's like, it helps me keep the weight off too. I'm sure like in terms of my physical, you know, performance, it absolutely is a big part of, it, you know, in, into my thirties now. Um, but, you know, it's something that just, like, really crept up over time, you know. It was always a stress release, being in New York City, being so freaking stressful of a place to live, too. You know, that was sure. one of the few things was, like, that I always looked forward to. Even as crazy as fishing in New York was, it was still less crazy than being on the Belt Parkway and all that other stuff, too, man. So, yeah, no, it's, sure, it's yeah. definitely, it, it, there was never a moment of, like, me fishing all the time for, like, doing it for the money or doing it for the fame. No, it's absolutely the, the love of it. Like, if you took away all the money right now and all the other stuff, um, even though I might, you know, go back to work somewhere else, I'd still probably fish a lot. I probably would, I you know, until I figured out another hobby, but probably <laughs> if I didn't. You know, well, you're, you know, back then you also couldn't, you probably couldn't fish for a living. No, I not, mean, in the, not in the same way you do now. You know, right. I mean, my options back in, you know, my early twenties was to be a for hire type capacity, probably, you know, being made or on like a boat. being made on a boat or right. something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so no, it's definitely, you know, I'll ride, I'll ride it as long as I can. You know? Yeah, no, you're doing a good job. I see you, uh, you, you know, you seem to be hooking up all the time, putting out good content yeah. and your fans. They appreciate what you do. As long as they keep as long as they still loving me, and I still keep, as long as I keep making people happy. Um, that's a strange way to put it, but as long as I make people happy and people keep liking what I'm doing, I should be able to keep doing what I'm doing. So until people get how, sick how of did me. you get? How did you get the the drive to do your first video? I know that's that's so difficult for a lot of people. Like tell that my story. first video, how did, how did so, my first like hunt fifty videos sucked. I could, how'd you get how'd you get the the nerve or the the whatever you want to call it to actually take a camera go out shoot a video thinking people want to watch this uh, like how did that come about you were just like i'm just going to do this one day or did you think about it for a while before i you mean I, first time? I think one of the things was like i was definitely not the first kayak guys i mean I, but i was definitely in that group of earlier adopters of this kayak fishing game so like at that time it was like you know, putting up the numbers on the kayak was still, you know, kind of fresh at one point, you know, to see the kayak guys catching a lot of fish and catching big fish. And, you know, some guy, there was a lot of guys in the Chesapeake area that were doing it. Kayak Kevin and a couple of these other guys were, yeah, there was a guy named Kayak Kevin. Yes, Josh. He's still a guy named Kayak Kevin. But, um, <laughs> there's, um, but there's a lot of guys in that Chesapeake region that were, man, they were like really like between the reds and the stripers. And, you know, they were like a big inspiration to see what they were doing. And they were like three to four years ahead of me in terms of um, the content they were putting out and they were doing DVDs and stuff. So, you know, I wasn't the first, but, um, you know, it was kind of early at, you know, at least catching big fish and doing that kind of stuff from a kayak. I was definitely one of the earlier adopters. Yeah. And how long did it take for your videos to sort of catch on to where you thought to yourself, well, okay, see, I've got I've got a bit of a following going. See, my biggest problem early on was um, my how I presented myself on camera, and that's tough. You know, it's hard to to show that you're a personality on camera that people can like and watch. You know, some people just aren't good at presenting themselves, and I'm not the best either at sure. presenting myself. Um, but I would say it took. I'm now in year three 
of really putting myself like full time uploading. Um, this is the third year. The first year that I did really good was, you know, showing that I was a person that you can like. <laughs> and uh, I uploaded regularly, catching cooks, all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, this is the sorry the last year last year was the first year that i really took off to a degree with you know stuff content like catching cooks and just really trying smiling on camera i think i didn't start smiling till last year on camera josh <laughs> <laughs> well that makes sense for you but you you've had you've had a pretty accelerated year right i mean you started off on youtube with what you have 25 this year, I think I had about 25,000 subscribers at the beginning of this year. So we're at 51 now. So, you know, it's, it's, I think if I smiled That's since day job. one. <laughs> yeah, if you say you'd be over 100 if you smiled from day one. <laughs> if I smiled from day one. Yeah, I mean, it might have been over 100. Yep, if I smiled and, uh, did, you know, and, and didn't, look, you know, yeah, there's lots of things I should have done. But it is what it is, so. Uh, but anyway, all right, we had an hour. Thank you, Josh, for joining me today. Um uh, it was good. Hopefully some insight. Um, like I said, give him a follow on Instagram and YouTube. All the links are going to be in the video's description to jnh.com and in the social media outlets. Um, Josh is the guy who donated the Shimano Stratic for the Florence raffle and the initial guy who gave it, you know, gave it a little push to get it going to where we're at right now, which is at $2,000 in raffle donations, which for Hurricane Florence. So thank you, Josh. That's awesome. Well, you're welcome. Anytime, man. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Thank you. Later.